Good evening and a very warm welcome to the second part of the 2021 Ditsbury Lectures. My name is Samuel Hildebrandt. I'm a lecturer in Old Testament and Biblical Studies here. And it is with great delight and equally great expectations um, that I introduce our speaker tonight and welcome all of you here in the chapel on campus and online at home. Our speaker today is, as yesterday, Professor John Barclay, the Lightfoot Professor of Divinity from the University of Durham. To most of us, John is known primarily in his role as a scholar and as a writer, indeed as one of the key voices that over the last decades has labored to read Paul again in his context in his own world of Mediterranean Judaism and the Roman Empire. Personally, I had my first encounter with John's work um, since I'm an Old Testament major, yeah. first encounter, in a context very much like this one, a research seminar at a British university. To this day, uh, because you hear many of those when you're a student and a scholar, but to this day, this one still stands out. And I still remember the, the clarity of presentation, this very keen sense of timing and time, this creative use of language that we witnessed yesterday already, the um, being with um, and the self, um, the language in that, and that refreshingly scholarly skill to tackle something as mundane as giving and receiving, something we do all the time, and to look at that afresh and have me sit there and think afresh about something as profound as grace. I'm sure that after yesterday evening and after John's sermon in our chapel service this morning, you all now share with me in this impression of John as a speaker. It is a gift to have you among us, John, but in the spirit of the lecture series, we hope that this will not just be an exercise of us sitting here or at home of taking and receiving, but rather that we may think with you. And in the Q&A that follows, you have opportunity to ask questions afterwards online, in the chat, or here in person. In the Q&A, or also over tea and coffee after the lecture, that we will find some ways to give back to you and to live out this exercise of a Christian community that is so dear to us at NTC. So join me in welcoming John as he comes up to speak to us this evening. Well, hello again, everybody, and thank you very much for coming out tonight, those of you who are here, and to those of you joining online, um, welcome, and um, I'm uh, delighted you're able to join us in that way. And I know we're going to make sure tonight that the questions are audible as well as the answers, so you should be able to hear all parts of this um, activity tonight. And I want to uh, thank Samuel for his hospitality tonight, uh, and Tom and Eleanor Noble, thank you very much for the wonderful meal you gave me last night. I've been treated uh, extremely, extremely well, and Michael took me out for lunch today. I mean, I'm just going out for meals the whole time. It's just great. That's the great thing about a visiting lecturer. You just get, you just get treated uh, as royalty. So thank you very much indeed for your, for your kindness in that. Now, um, as last night, there is a handout to give you a bit of a structure where, where we're going. I hope you've been able to pick that up, and that will give you a, some signposts along the way. Now, in the first lecture last night, I discussed some of the problems associated with the modern concept of charity as top-down, one-way giving. I also charted some of the reasons why we have come to this modern definition of altruism with its zero-sum calculation that the interests of the other are, in principle, exclusive of the interests of the self. That is an either-or model whereby if anything returns to me or benefits me, my giving is diminished or tainted as incompletely altruistic. My aim today is to begin exploring with you some of the resources we might find in Paul for an alternative ethic which is founded on a vision of co-flourishing and conjoint benefit, and where whatever elements we find of a self-other contrast are, and this is crucial, embedded within 
a larger frame and a larger purpose of flourishing together. Now, since Paul's vision of society, his social vision, is entwined with his understanding of what we might call the sacred order, where the ultimate goods are determined by God and enacted in Christ, we shall approach his ethics within this theological framework. Although we will ask in our final lecture on Thursday whether Paul's vision can be communicated and applied outside of that framework. Today, after outlining the narrative shape of this Pauline framework, I will turn our attention to two segments of Paul's letters. First, the instructions on the collection for Jerusalem in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And then the exhortations about social conduct worthy of the good news that runs from Philippians 1 into the famous Christ hymn in Philippians 2. On the basis of these two rich texts, we'll be able to perceive, I hope, the outline of a Pauline social ethic, and then tomorrow we'll be able to sketch in more of the details within that outline. So let's first think about the Christ narrative, as I'm calling it, as a gift story. Now, it's a common tendency in philosophy, one might say a kind of besetting sin in philosophy, to turn narratives into abstracts and to translate stories with their characters, their dynamic developments, their final goals, to turn stories into timeless, static principles, removed from a narrative frame and re-expressed as ethical propositions. Now, an element of narrative was in fact built into ancient Greek ethics, which asked about the goal, the telos, I'm going to use that word telos quite a lot tonight, it means the goal, the end point, uh, that Greek ethics asked about the goal, the telos, of human flourishing. What is our final end? How shall we get there? But in modern Western philosophy, that easily gets lost in the quest for essential timeless, that essential timeless good, which is taken to be universally true for all people in all places and at all times. Now, you can see immediately, perhaps, the problems that this timelessness would cause for notions of gift. Gifts are designed to build relationships over time. The return of the gift is typically not immediate, but necessarily delayed, part of an ongoing cycle of reciprocity. So if you freeze the action at any moment in this gift, in a gift narrative, to say, is this or is this not a true gift? You would be cutting one action out of the narrative sequence and artificially attempting to distill an ethic in a singular act or singular intention. Paul's ethic is not a timeless abstract, a singular rule, or a universal principle. Whatever he has to say ethically is embedded within a Christological narrative that begins before all time, that enters human time, that extends over time, and that has a future telos, a future goal, to which the narrative of humanity and the world is directed. So if we asked Paul about the grace or gift or the love of God, he would tell us a story whose central point is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and whose final goal, its eschatological telos, lies in the future. God's grace or favor is given to unfitting recipients, to people Paul describes as sinful, weak, unrighteous, and enemies of God. But its purpose, says Paul, is transformative, to create righteous people out of the unrighteous, people in tune with God out of people alienated from God's will. It's a gift designed to alter the conditions of the world. And so it has to be placed on a trajectory within a narrative of change. So we might expect that what is said of God's action at some points of the sequence, at its start, for instance, or at its center, may not be the full story. 
and may not reflect what should be said of its completion or its end. The story of God's consistent, self-giving love towards the world takes a particular narrative shape in the life, death, resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus. But no one part of that story is the complete story, and each episode is designed to lead to a goal fuller than itself. So to use an example that will be important for us, the crucified Christ tells us something absolutely central about the self-giving of God, but it's not the end of the story, not its final destination. The cross is part of a larger matrix, not an end in itself. Rather than freeze the frame, we should let the story run on and trace the narrative to the end. Only then will we see how the whole fits together and reaches its goal. So to put that in simple terms, to explore the Pauline ethic properly is always to ask, what's the larger story? The wider framework is not a more general set of propositions, but a trajectory with a goal and an intended conclusion. That's why in both of the passages that we will examine today, which concern the Christ event, we need to ask not just, well, what's the ethic in this story, but also, and at the same time, and what's the bigger story? So let's move now to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul's appeal for the Jerusalem collection. The fullest and the richest treatment of gift-giving in Paul is found in this, his appeal to the Corinthian church regarding their contribution towards the collection that he's gathering for the believers in Jerusalem. Paul had earlier organized a collection among churches linked to Antioch for the believers in Jerusalem, a collection that was part of the agreement between Paul and the Jerusalem apostles mentioned in Galatians 2. Now it seems he's making a new collection. I think these are two different collections. Now I think he's making, uh, now he's, he seems to be making a new collection among churches he had founded in Galatia, Macedonia, and Achaia, among which the church in Corinth was, he would have hoped, the most generous. But as is the way with gifts, this gift project was more complicated than expected. It's kind of like you feel, uh-oh, Paul's making a gift collection. This is, going to be, this is going to be complicated. Things are going to go wrong here. The purpose in Paul's eyes was to link believers from his Gentile churches with the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, as we can see from his depiction of the project in Romans 15. As was normal, gifts created or intended to create and express social ties. There was, of course, nothing anonymous about this gift. Indeed, it had to be as public as possible if it was to achieve its social goals. But it was not clear to all of Paul's converts how and why they should be connected to Jerusalem. Giving across a distance to persons unknown was unusual in antiquity, and it demanded high levels of commitment and of trust. At the same time, many Jewish believers in Jerusalem had strong misgivings about Paul. And we know that on the point of delivering the collection, Paul was not at all sure that they would accept it. To make matters worse, the believers in Corinth had lost confidence in Paul, and seeds of doubt had been sown as to whether this collection was really headed for Jerusalem or whether it might end up in, as we would say, Paul's own back pocket. It was Paul's project, but had become, in the Corinthians' eyes, problematically associated with him. And we find him needing to use his delegates, like Titus, or representatives of other churches, like the Macedonians, to persuade the Corinthians to follow through on their initial enthusiasm to contribute to this collection. As is typical of Paul, his arguments on this matter are both highly rhetorical and highly theological. Through 2 Corinthians 8 to 9, he weaves an intricate web of argumentation, some of it connected by the natural link in Greek between the different senses of the Greek term charis, which means grace or gift and benefit, but also favor, 
and also thanks or gratitude. Starting with the example of the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul begins the whole argument with, we want you to know the charis, the grace or the favor of God given to the churches in Macedonia. These, he goes on to say, begged him for the favor, charis, of taking part in the collection, the collection which he calls this charis. Just as you excel in everything, says Paul, with a degree of holy flattery, so, he says, now excel in this charis. Only he's careful to say it as advice and not command, and he backs it up by his central Christological warrant, for you know the charis of our Lord Jesus Christ, that because he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Now there's more going on here than simply wordplay. Paul is making an effort to place what he wants and hopes from the Corinthians, their gift or charis, within a narrative frame, and in particular the narrative frame of the Christ gift. The gift he's requesting is not just modeled on the gift of Christ, but is founded on it, enabled by it, flows from it as a river cascades from its source. To give to Jerusalem, as the Macedonians have done, is to pass on forward what has been received, to enter into a dynamic of grace which was intended to flow on out in generosity to others. So in a strong sense, what they are to give is not fully their own, but what's been entrusted to them in order that it might be shared. This charis is what an anthropologist would call an inalienable gift. That is a gift that is passed on, but always still bears the traces, even the ownership of the first giver. Think, for instance, of an heirloom piece of jewelry inherited from your granny that will always remain hers, even if it's come into your possession. That's the kind of thing we're talking about, an inalienable gift. It's yours, but it's not yours in a fullest sense. The gift given by God in Christ is passed on by human donors who have, we might say, possession of the gift, but but not full ownership. They're brokers of someone else's goods, which they, pay, which they were given to pay forward in giving to others. Or rather, you, you might say they pay God's gift back, they return it to God in paying it forward, in passing it on to others. The Macedonians, Paul reports, first gave themselves to the Lord, but they've given back to the Lord precisely in their wholehearted contribution to the Jerusalem collection. Elsewhere in these chapters, Paul figures the Corinthians' contribution to the collection as an act of worship, a, a liturgia, an act by which they glorify God and cause multiple thanksgivings, Eucharistiae, another play on words there, to return to God. So note, this is not a choice between giving to God or giving to Jerusalem, nor really are they giving really to one and only apparently to the other, or even primarily to God and only secondarily to Jerusalem. The gift is to one at the same time and fully a gift to the other. Sorry, I'll say it again. The gift to one is at the same time and fully a gift to the other. And I guess you might think that's not just a matter of theory, but a practice. The earliest Christian communities whose worship involved no expensive sacrifices or cultic objects or buildings to maintain could fully integrate their devotion to God with their gifts to others. So, the gift or grace that comes from God circulates in human gifts, which are at the same time a form of reciprocity back to God in obedience, service, and thanks. But the grace of God is, of course, not a thing. It's not an object transferred between persons. So how does it get passed on as a material gift? 
Is there some kind of strange chemistry that changes God's grace into human monetary gifts? No, rather what happens, you might say, is this. What God gives in Christ is God's self, in open-handed self-giving. And what's passed on by humans and circulates among them is this same quality of relationship. A quality of relationship which may be expressed in many different forms, material and and non-material. Now this, I think, is the best way to read that intriguing statement about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that I cited just now. Now you may know it as it's usually translated, where it goes, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Which suggests that Christ possessed wealth in some sense, a wealth consisting of divine status or certain divine properties, but that he renounced that wealth in becoming poor, that is, becoming human, with the result that believers come to share in those spiritual properties once enjoyed by Christ. But I think there's another and a better way of reading this text, which the Greek absolutely allows. Because in these chapters, Paul does something very interesting with the concept of wealth. We think of wealth as something that you possess, but for Paul, wealth is something given or something shared. People are wealthy, as he describes them, in their giving, not wealthy in their possession. Just before this Uh, extraordinary statement about Christ, Paul had spoken about the Macedonians whose abundance of joy and depth of poverty had overflowed, he says, in a wealth of single-hearted giving. So the wealth is in the giving, not in the possessing. It was usual, in fact, in the ancient world to think of wealth in relational terms. You're wealthy not just in having much, but in being able to give to others. Or you're poor, not just in having little, but precisely in the fact that you are unable to give or to share with others. So the Macedonians' wealth consists of their open-hearted generosity, just as Paul will assure the Corinthians that they too will be enriched, note that, enriched, in every way for every form of single-hearted giving. So I think our verse about Christ is best translated this way. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that because he was rich, rich, that is, in the self-giving love of God, he became poor, that is, he entered fully into the incapacities and dependencies of the human condition, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Rich, that is, in the same self-giving richness, that is the meaning and momentum of the Christ event. All right. So this is not this is not uh, a um, prosperity gospel. Um, it's not promising you will be materially rich. It's promising you will be rich in giving. That you will be enriched in Christ in order to give. The Corinthians' gift is thus to be the continuation and expression of the Christ gift, a sign of their transformed existence in the flow of the narrative that runs from the life, death, and resurrection of Christ into the remaking of human relations and heading towards their telos, their fulfillment in Christ. Note that this human giving is expressly described by Paul not as self-damaging but as a form of self-fulfillment enrichment. Paul is careful not to sound like he's using a command, and he says, in this matter I'm giving my advice. It is beneficial for you, who began this project last year, not only to do it, but to want to do it. Interesting. Beneficial for you. If the eagerness is there, he says, the gift is acceptable to God according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean there should be relief to others and hardship for you. Paul does not want the Corinthians to be crushed or diminished or destroyed by their giving. To the contrary, he wants the act of giving, if willed and not dragged out of them as a forced extraction, 
He wants the act of giving to be an expression of their new identity in Christ and thus beneficial to them in helping them become what they were designed to be. As he puts it a few verses later, God loves a cheerful giver. Because such giving accords with the momentum of God's self-giving movement towards the world. It takes one, you might say, into the very center of God's loving self. So Paul can be confident that God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As he puts it in, in 2 Corinthians 9. It's as if God's creative gener generosity will find a way to make everyone capable of giving in some form and to some degree. Not so that they themselves fall into lack, but out of some kind of sufficiency. Even the Macedonians, who Paul describes as, as being in the depth of poverty, found a way to give. Their giving, note, did not cause their poverty, it emerged out of it, in a gift that Paul reckons as a sign of their God-enabled generosity. Now, I think this is very interesting because in this text, Paul is highly attuned to questions of honor. And we may note how the Macedonians here attained a dignity in giving that is the opposite of what is expected of the poor in the ancient world. Then, as today, poverty is associated with shame. The shame of always asking. The shame of being dependent upon others. The shame of never being able to, to return a gift, but having to ask again. The shame of falling into one-way dependence. It's symptomatic of that shame that among the um, graffiti found in Pompeii, I'm sorry Peter Oakes isn't in the room here to tell you more about it, but in, among the graffiti found in Pompeii is one that reads this. I hate poor people. If anyone wants something for nothing, he's a fool. Let him pay for it. Note the scorn directed against the poor, who are perceived as always scroungers and never able to pay, always taking never giving or giving back. By contrast, Paul celebrates the fact that even the poor believers in Macedonia were able to give. He doesn't say how much, because the quantity doesn't matter. What matters is that even they were able to become part of what the Christ gift designed them to be, cheerful givers whose conformity to God's order, God's righteousness, Paul declares, is of eternal significance and will endure forever. So, interestingly, this gift that clearly benefits its recipients is figured by Paul as also of benefit to the givers. There's no zero-sum calculation whereby more for one equals less for the other. No embarrassment that to give might also be, as Paul says to them, to your benefit. This is not because the benefit is divided out, as it were, between giver and recipient, but because the giving itself is the fulfillment of the giver. The gift costs money, but it doesn't cost the self. What's more, Paul doesn't imagine it as a one-way phenomenon. Elsewhere, in Romans 15, he described the collection as a kind of return gift, since the good news had spread from Jerusalem, and this monetary support of Jerusalem is owed, as it were, as a kind of return. That's how he described it in Romans 15. Here in, Ro in, in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he puts it another way around, as an oscillating gift relationship, whereby a gift one way at one time will be matched at another time by a return in some form. It's a question of... a or it's a question of equality, he says, between your present abundance and their need. And then he surprises us by saying, in order that their abundance may be for your need. 
that there may be equality. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. A quotation there from the story of the manna, which is a good example of a divine gift shared among human recipients. At present, Paul says, there's an imbalance between surplus on one side and need on the other, and that needs to be corrected. But this relationship is not designed to remain one-sided in one way. When they receive the gift, Paul says, the Jerusalem saints will long for you. Longing is a kind of long-distance love. And they will pray for you. And prayer is, in Pauline terms, a significant return in itself. But he also imagines that a surplus will run in the other direction. Their abundance will be for your need, though he doesn't say how or when. So that the relationship is figured here as one of mutual dependence and reciprocal benefit, not as the top-down giving from an all-sufficient benefactor. Now, there's a certain generality here and a certain amount of idealism in Paul's language. Perhaps the reality under the surface of this text was more complex and even more compromised than Paul portrays. But for our purposes, it's the ideal that matters, because what we're trying to identify here are resources for thinking about gift giving and the patterns by which Paul portrays what giving is meant to be. And note how different this is from our expectations of charity. These Corinthians are not wealthy benefactors giving to an ever-dependent poor. The giving is not anonymous, it's not top-down, and it's not one way. It doesn't operate by a zero-sum calculation of loss to some and benefit to others. Because it benefits also the giver, such giving is not what we might call today purely selfless. When Paul says God loves the cheerful giver, it's clear he does not subscribe to our modern ideal of no return altruism. And that's because he doesn't figure the self and the other as exclusive entities. This giving, he says, is a form of koinonia, a partnership or solidarity in which there is conjoined benefit. What they share is the momentum of divine self-giving that energizes their giving and enables the gift to flow and to circulate back in many directions. As brokers of the divine gift, all the partners enter into a movement of divine self-giving by which they become rich. Now, if that doesn't fit our modern ideals of no return altruism, perhaps the problem lies with us. Let's move on now to our text from Philippians, thinking in Christ in the letter to the Philippians. Now, at first sight, and as commonly interpreted, Paul's letter to the Philippians looks like it fits very well our modern notion of altruism. At its center lies the story of Christ, who emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Whatever else it is, that's surely a story of sacrificial self-giving, whose acme, or peak, is death. In the verses that precede this Christ hymn, the Philippians are urged to do nothing from selfish conceit or ambition, but in humility regard others as more important than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. There are textual variants in that last clause that complicate the picture a little bit, but the general thrust seems to fit our modern antitheses. Not yourself, but others. Not selfishness, but other regard. Read in this way, Christ could be hailed as a moral hero, the great exemplar of self-renunciation. And indeed, in recent years, cruciformity, that is the shaping of one's life around the self-giving of the cross, has been identified by Michael Gorman as the centerpiece of Pauline theology. Doesn't Paul here claim that he's glad to be poured out as a libation on the sacrifice of your faith? 
Does he not praise Timothy for seeking not his own interests, but the welfare of the Philippians and the interests of Christ? Well, yes, but everything depends on the larger framework in which these self-giving movements are placed. Are they an end in themselves, or are they part of a larger trajectory, a wider story, in which the self is not renounced, but reconfigured and fulfilled? You could put it this way. If death is the acme of Christ's love, its supremely costly expression, is it also its telos, its purpose, or goal? We start to realize that something else is at work when we see that the Christ hymn does not finish with the statements about Christ's emptying, humiliation, and obedience. It doesn't stop there. It continues, Therefore also God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name, and it concludes with an eschatological vision of every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The cross is not the end of the story. And I take the resurrection or exaltation of Jesus to be not just the revelation of who he is, nor some reward for his life of service, but the goal to which the whole drama is moving. The confession of Jesus as Lord represents the realignment of all creation to its saving Lord. A salvific finale that Paul calls elsewhere the liberation of all creation from its slavery to decay. In other words, the Christ story is not, first and foremost, an ethical tale. It's the story of salvation, in which Christ enters fully into the human condition and submits himself entirely to its limitations and loss, precisely to bring all humanity and all creation with it to its appointed destiny in God. In an echo of the hymn, a little later in, the, in this letter um, to the Philippians, Paul looks forward to the time when the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, will transform the body of our humiliation so that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, a fulfillment derived from Christ's universal lordship. The logic of salvation in this passage is what Morna Hooker has called interchange, or what Susan Eastman labels double participation. Christ participates in our condition that we may participate in his. Jesus enters into the very depths of human degradation and even into death, even into death precisely to envelop our poverty with his richness, to swallow up death in life. Throughout Jesus' path of descent, even to death, he operated, Paul says, in obedience. That is, in obedience to God. Obedience is, for Paul, Jesus' singular mark that no human being had displayed since Adam. Obedience indicates that there is a divine purpose in this descent, and that in Jesus' solidarity with the limitations and weaknesses of human life, Jesus maintained an unfailing link with the Father. His obedience, as it were, tethers the whole human experience to the life of God, holding it within God's purpose and reach. Why? So that God's redemptive power might work from within the alienated world and might absorb, enclose, and thereby transform what is lost. It was because Jesus descended to these depths, but still in obedience was joined to the saving purposes of God, that therefore God installed him as universal Lord, as the fulfillment of the plan to which Jesus was obedient. Although the exaltation of Jesus was a reversal of his human condition, it fulfilled the purpose of the emptying. Jesus went to those depths not to display an ethical ideal, but to envelop the whole gamut of human life and death within the renewing 
love of God, a purpose that reaches its goal in the saving lordship of Christ. Once we see this, we can ascertain the larger framework in which Paul puts those statements about his own self-sacrifice and his instructions to the Philippians to seek the interests of others. When he weighs up the possibilities in his prison cell, you remember, Paul considers that despite his preference, it might be best if he remain in the flesh, since it is, as he says, more necessary for you. But this is not a simple suppression of his self for the sake of the other, because when he continues with them in their progress and joy in their faith, this will be, he says, a joy that he shares. It's not their joy at the expense of his, but their conjoint joy. That, as he says, I might share abundantly in your boasting in Christ when I come to you again. In the same way, the point of being poured out as a libation on the sacrifice of their faith is that, he says, he may be glad and rejoice with all of you. Note again the Greek preposition sun, with, which is very prominent in this letter, where Paul and the Philippians are, as he puts it, sun koinonoi, in grace, sharers with one another and co-sharers in the grace of God. So ultimately, again, this is not a zero-sum calculation. More for the Philippians means less for Paul. No, his self-giving for them results in his, we might say, self-fulfillment with them. Or to use the words of my former student, Logan, Logan Williams, Paul gives himself not away, he gives himself into a relationship with them. Ultimately, in fact, his self is secure in Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Note that language of gain, which you know would make any modern altruist really, really nervous, wouldn't it? Like Paul, Paul's after his gain, after all. Yeah, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yes, because in Christ he is fulfilled as he is meant to be, such that all acts of self-giving on his part or on their part are not about the loss of the self. What is sacrificed is what would compete with the interests of others. But Paul is redefining the self such that the interests of the self are joined to the interests of the other. As I was saying yesterday, we modern Westerners work with the antithesis selfish or selfless. Paul's ideal is neither of these, but is a goal I'm calling self-with. And self-with, importantly, is not a midpoint along the spectrum which runs from selfishness to selflessness. It's a different model of the self, which does not have to be defined in exclusive terms, the self or the other. Rather, in stripping off what is purely self-centered, this self finds its new center of fulfillment with the other in conjoint benefit. Now, this is, is the frame in which to read the instructions on humility and on counting others more important than yourself. The instruction to look out for the interests of others is importantly reciprocal. Each of you to look out to the interests of others. So it's a command to each and every person as they consider one another, another of those one another phrases, of higher status than themselves. There's no possibility here that one member or one type of member should be subjected to a one-sided exercise of power because everyone is at the same time looking out for the superior interests of everyone else. Now that's a very paradoxical notion, but it's absolutely characteristic of Paul to put it like that. It's as if his path to equalization imagines not a static equality, but what we might call a kind of reciprocal asymmetry, a reciprocal inequality, if you like. So what is unequal in one way is constantly being balanced out by what's unequal in another. The self serves the other at the same time as the other serves the self or as Paul puts it elsewhere, through love, be slaves of one another. 
This mutual service for one another is a necessary antidote to rivalry, which is, of course, rivalry is the stance of the self against the other. But the purpose is not the flourishing of the other at the expense of the self, but the construction of a harmonious community. And the harmonious community is part in the larger, in the larger picture, is part of that action of reconciliation of the world that every knee should bow and every tongue confess. In other words, the instructions to humility and to serving the interests of others are intended to secure the goal that the Philippians be of the same mind and share the same love. Solidarity arises through mutual commitments, and the Philippians are to put the self to work for one another with the goal that every member should be with one another. So, the goal of the Christ narrative in its renunciation of taking and in its self-emptying of human forms of power, the goal of that narrative is not that Christ should be selfless, but self-with. The eschatological goal of the whole narrative is not, apart from Christ, effected, as it were, through the obliteration of Christ, but is necessarily with Christ, fulfilled in his resurrection and exaltation to lordship over the world. Wrapped within this Christological narrative and moving towards its end, believers are called to renounce whatever turns the self into a self apart or a self against. But that involves not the loss of the self, but the relocation of the self in solidarity with others. And the fulfillment of both self and other in shared solidarity with Christ. A few words then in conclusion. We've dug in a little depth into two segments of Paul's correspondence, a rich section of 2 Corinthians and certain aspects of his letter to the Philippians. A lot more could be said about both texts. Other texts could be brought into the discussion, and we'll do that a little bit tomorrow. What can we say thus far? There's a strong modern expectation, both inside and outside the Christian community, that the Christian ethic is quintessentially an ethic of self-sacrifice. That the self is given, that is, given away, for the service of the other, and that Christian charity is a form of strong altruism that sits at the extreme selfless end of the spectrum that runs from selfishness to selflessness. Selfless end of that spectrum. In modern moral philosophy regarding self-interest, what's called pure Christian charity is routinely characterized as a love focused only on the other, regardless of the expense to oneself. For many Christians, this is what makes love, agape love, radical and authentically Christian. Now what I'm arguing here is that Christian love is radical, but it does not glorify the annihilation of the self. Now, you may be thinking, but what about those texts about denying yourself? If anyone wants to follow me, says Jesus, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Yes, but what, how does he continue? Those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Note the paradox. The end point of denying and losing is not an ultimate loss, but an ultimate salvation. Just as the Jesus who goes to the cross in the Gospels, the, the, the Christ crucified in the letters of Paul, does not end there, but is raised and exalted as the Lord of the cosmos. If we froze the story on Good Friday, we would have one image. But the Christian story does not end there and cannot end there. The cross indicates the character and the depth of God's self-giving, but the goal of God's loving self-identification with the world is that the world should be saved not apart from God, but in God, and not in the absence of Christ, but with Christ. What we've seen in Paul is not an ethic, but a story, a story shaped by the self-giving love of God 
but that cannot be reduced to a, an ethical principle or a rule. The goal, Paul tells the Corinthians, is that you might be rich. Rich, as we've seen, in generous self-giving, but that very generosity is figured as an enrichment of the self. Paul does not want the donors to the collection diminished while others are enlarged. He wants all parties to draw from the surplus supplied by God precisely as they give from that surplus to one another. We found patterns of reciprocity woven right through Paul's theology even into an apparently one-way gift like the collection for Jerusalem. As we shall see tomorrow, that reciprocity need not be direct and it need not be bilateral one to another and then directly back. It may be diffused, so that what's given comes back not directly from the recipient of the gift, but from others in a wider community of giving and receiving. But what this illustrates and what we've seen throughout is that in Paul's model, self-giving is not a giving of the self away, but a giving of the self into a communal relationship, a social solidarity, in which one does not have to conduct zero-sum calculations of the more for you, the less for me. Just as in a marriage, each partner will flourish only if the other flourishes too, so Paul imagines a koinonia in which the goal is for all to flourish, not for some to flourish at the expense of the other. In such a relationship, there are elements of the self that have to be corrected, it can only work if you chip away at the self that desires to be the self apart, or the self above, or the self against the other. But the goal in correcting those tendencies is not to be selfless, but what I'm calling self with, which is challenging and difficult in itself, but importantly positions the self within a conjoint benefit and a mutual process of flourishing. This is not a diluted form of agape love, but is the arena in which the self seeks 100% the good of the other, but also in that other concern, it reaches its fullest dignity and ultimate fulfillment. Within Christian faith, that horizon is eschatological. And as Oliver O'Donovan has said, no account of the Christian moral life can be adequate unless it's allowed to point forward to the resurrection. This eschatological fulfillment should be seen not as an extrinsic reward, like a wage for a job well done, but as an intrinsic enrichment, the satisfaction of attaining your desired potential. I was just in a house tonight where the children are learning the piano. If you promise your child extra pocket money for doing their piano practice, that's an extrinsic reward a reward not intrinsically related to the music itself. If you promise them enrichment through their enjoyment of music and their capacity to create it, you're holding out an intrinsic reward. In the best Christian visions of an eschatological telos, the fulfillment is not individualized but communal, and it's not a gain for the self apart from others, but again with others and with Christ. That's a distinctively Christian version of the ancient notion of the good as aimed towards the flourishing of the self, what we label eudaimonism. In the modern era, many philosophers wrongly critique eudaimonism as a form of selfishness. And as we saw yesterday, they've created the ideal of the pure gift that's 100% for others in a form that cannot be a benefit to the self. And in that form of altruism, as Derrida developed it, death is not just the acme of self-giving, it is indeed its telos. It's only in dying, Derrida said, that I can ensure that I gain nothing from my gift, even in the form of self-congratulation. We must resist the temptation to acclaim that version of altruism as truly Christian. And here I join forces with John Milbank and others who've rightly critiqued that modern construal of the pure gift. But the answer is not to pull back a little from the extreme and to find some more moderate form of self-giving. The answer is to think again from the bottom up why we have created this inescapable, apparently inescapable antithesis of self versus other. 
and to ask whether we can find other and better models for thinking about ourselves and about gifts. As we've begun to see, there are perhaps Christian resources for doing just that, and we'll explore them further tomorrow with the aid of other Pauline texts, particularly 1 Corinthians 12 on the body and 1 Corinthians 11 on the Lord's Supper. Whether or how these explorations in Paul could prove beneficial today is a matter we will consider in the final lecture of this series. I thank you for staying with me today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. After yesterday, you traveled very long distance yeah. and mapped this out, and today you narrowed us down to two particular passages. Yeah. Thank you for that balance. Yeah. Um, talking about balance, uh, we'll have questions from the room and questions from the online stream, and we'll start with anybody in the room who has a question. I'll ask you to come up to the microphone so everybody can hear us online and in the room. You want to go ahead? Another excellent lecture. You talked uh, yesterday about philanthropy. Yes. And I was thinking that a lot of the texts you looked at today were very much about a, s a more direct relationship between giver and recipient. But philanthropy yes. is as, as much about realizing values and goods, and the giver may never meet the recipients. Yeah. And so, can Paul, can Paul speak to that? And there's another dimension to philanthropy, which is that the giver gets to sort of actualize their vision of the common good. You mentioned yeah. that yesterday, which mm. other people can't do if they're not mm. that kind of well. So whether Paul's yeah. stuff can speak to that. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, I mean, philanthropy can, can cover a wide range of things, but modern philanthropy, as you say, uh, is very, tends to be very much large scale, large distance, and often determined by the interests, sometimes this quirky interests <laughs> of the philanthropist. Um, and, um, well, there are obvious, obvious problems with that. Um, I and mean, I think the kind of giving that Paul is interested in is giving that is genuinely personal. Although there is a distance, of course, between Corinth and Jerusalem, and in that sense there's something a long distance about it, it it's also mediated by people. Uh, that the gift is taken and, and the delegates go from the churches to Jerusalem, so it's, it's personalized and not entirely um, impersonal. Now I know, you know, you might say in the modern world with the scale of the problems we're talking about and the scale of the issues, it inevitably tends towards Im impersonality. But I think um, we've recognized the problems in that. Um, we've recognized that um, unless we understand really well uh, and listen really hard to what people are saying at, uh, as well, the other end of, of the gift, we're very, very likely to impose the wrong agenda. And so at, at the very least, there's that openness to, um, to continually consult. You know, so many aid programs have gone wrong because they've been, they've been premised on the wrong assumptions, haven't they? That, oh, we'll give you a wonderful piece of machinery, but, oh, there's nobody within 300 miles who could fix it when it goes wrong. You know? <laughs> um, or we'll do this because we think you know, this is really important, and then it sets up really, really awful power balances in the community and so on. So unless that even philanthropic gift is deeply, deeply earthed in the wishes, desires, and visions of the of the recipients, it, it can go very badly wrong. But there's almost, as you say, almost now a kind of, in some circles, almost a kind of glor glorying in the, in the distancing of it. You know, I mean, I'm thinking of Peter Singer and his sort of effective altruism, like, you know, just do your research to find out what could, what could have the most effect and then just give to it as much as you can, even if the job you're doing to earn that money is pretty awful, you know, ethically awful job. At least you have money you can give. And, and it's, it's, it's very, very distant. It, it's, it's very, it, it's deliberately impersonal. And I think, um, yeah, I think what we've discovered actually is, is that that can, be, that can be problematic. But obviously Paul's talking at, at, a, much, at a much smaller scale, and, and so I, I appreciate the differences there. But thank you, that's a very good question.
Yeah, thank you. We have a question um, from the world out there, uh, from Jim West. Paul predates the Gospels, of course, but I'm wondering how Jesus saying, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, fits in with Paul's fundraising among the Corinthians and others. How can they give secretly in uh, such a situation? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the, the, secret, the, the secret giving in Matthew 6 is to solve a particular problem. Jesus is talking about people who give hypocritically, who give only to get public praise. He says, you know, walking down the street, blowing the trumpet, and the whole point is to get public honor. That's what the gift is about. And um, that's, for, for, for Jesus, a, a complete distortion of the gift, because no, it, it is not for the other now. It is, it is, it is purely for the self. It is for the, for the glory of being the giver. So the only way to make the gift genuinely for the other is to strip out from that situation any possibility of, of, of glory. So there are circumstances where that may be necessary um, but it's not like that's the rule of all of all giving if you think of all the other <laughs> stories in the gospels and all the others all, all the passages that we're talking about where it's certainly not anonymous because the problem with an anonymous gift is it is impersonal and if gifts actually are designed to help us flourish together then one has to know each side, each side of that gift relationship have, have to know each other. So there may be circumstances or conditions or problematics in a gift that require anonymity. There may be very special circumstances of that, but I think there are special circumstances rather than a general rule. And in particular, that story is directed against the person who gives for their own glory, and that's what the gift is about and nothing else. And Jesus says, well, make it entirely secret then it will be a gift truly for the good of the other. And yeah, you won't get the human reward, but God who sees in secret will reward you. Yeah. I think we have one more time for one more question since we've already passed our hour. And one more question from the room. I'm happy to take more than one. If, I'm happy to go on. If okay, uh, Elizabeth, yeah. do you want to come first and give us your question? Um, first of all, thank you so much for these lectures. I was watching online last night and oh, I'm here in person tonight. Um, but as you've been talking about this kind of balance between selfishness and selflessness, mm. the mm. one word that's come to mind has been subversion. And I recently oh, yeah. attended a lecture in Oxford on the subversive gospel, and it was oh, a lot yeah. broader in that sense. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about subversion in relation to all sorts of things in the Bible. So mm. uh, Jewish legalism versus Gentile lawlessness or um, poor versus rich or mm. the, you know, the least yeah. of you will become the most mm. of you. Mm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how this charity version, which right. you zoned in on a lot today, right. um, how does that uh, play into the sort of broader concept of subversion within right. the meta narrative of the gospel. Right. right. Um, thank you. Uh, that's 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 helpful. I th I think um, you've always got to be careful what exactly is being subverted, and you know it, I'm not sure subversion could be necessarily always the sort of the catchphrase for everything, um, because it seems to me that in this case. You know, it would be tempting to say, well, subversion means we subvert selfishness by going to the other end of that, of that stream. But I'm always wanting to ask, well, who set up that polar opposite? You know, why do we think subversion of this is that? Have we got the right kind of alternatives here? Um, and I think um, I'll say a bit more about this in future lectures. I think the true radicality, that what makes the, the, the gift the Christian gift, truly radical, is not that it refuses a return, or would rather not have a return, but that it's risky, that it gives even without the guarantee of a human return. 
That's why it can spread outside of the normal circles of reciprocity. That's what Jesus is asking for. Don't just give to those who give to you. Give wider than that circle, where you may not get a return. Because the radical gift of God in Christ is to stretch across the boundaries to those who are unworthy of the gift. And the radical gift of, 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 of the church is to stretch outside where, outside of the safe zone where you know you'll, you'll get a return and to try to create those relationships beyond. Uh, but they, they're risky. And that's why, you know, Essentially, that's why the early Christians called themselves trusters or believers. Yeah? <laughs> they, they trusted that there's a, there's a wider story, bigger than the story that you could see on the surface of things. Uh, and so that's, I'll say more, more about that in future, but I think, you know, so I'm, I'm fine with, sub, I mean, I, I see a lot of value in the, in, in the label subversion, but I'm always asking what exactly is being subverted and what's being put in its place. I think we'll take one more sure. from the internet, yeah. and then Svetlana, you can come and have the final word. Um, uh, Daniel Skuis is next in line, and he says this. You mentioned yesterday that part of the problem has been partly caused by a modern eschatological embarrassment. Yeah. Within contemporary Christianity, the death of Christ has received an oversimplification and reduced to a simple message rather than a change-affecting event. And equally, the resurrection has been seen less as an eschatological moment, but as a somewhat simple resolution and a promise of individualized eternal hope. Mm. So is part of the solution to the problem of modern charity a rediscovery of an eschatological or potentially even an apocalyptic right. framework? Mm. Mm. Thank you. That's a very good question. And again, um, I will actually say some more about this and, and the importance of eschatology. Yes, I think... Um, we, we've narrowed things down on so many fronts. You know, the, the sort of problematic, perhaps in the Protestant tradition, is to narrow down the story to Jesus and me, uh, as, as, as if it's about individual salvation, full stop. Uh, the la much, much larger biblical story of the restoration, reconciliation, uh, and recreation of the world reordered under the lordship of christ that's that's just that's mind-blowingly big for us but that's the big story that this is that this is all um, within as, we, as we've just seen in in the philippian hymn um but we've also um you know fallen prey i think to that sort of modern embarrassment with eschatology um and um i think i think if we if belief is trust that God is working God's purposes out for the rec restoration, reconciliation of the world, then you have to think into the future. Um, and um, that future, as I say, much, much bigger than just me uh, and the, the highly individualized for ways we think about it, but it is a future reality. We're living for the future and into the future it's as if we're the resurrection of Christ is as were the future already already beginning and we are directed towards it. And that may seem like, oh goodness, you know, Christians are you know always thinking about the future, can't they just focus on the present? But the present has to be seen in its in its proper proportions as directed to and and uh, oriented by God's action towards the future. So I do think um, we can't afford to give up on eschatology. I mean, that's why I quoted Oliver O'Donnell there. You can't get a proper Christian ethic without eschatology, um, without without resurrection. Um, I'm still, you know, trying to just get my head around all that that entails. But I think we shouldn't be embarrassed about that or, or give that up. Thank you. Really good ending because it's a compliment okay. <laughs> to end the lecture. Thank you very much for another uh, great evening. I just uh, like the idea of what you said and proposal on the gift that uh, Paul is referring to that is not only modeled 
in the gift of Christ, but actually flowing from it, as right. you said, I'm mm. quoting your words, and that the gift that is entering into dynamic relationship, into dynamic, and where the gift is also brokered and shared, and I like it that it's paid back and in paying it forward. Right. I think that phrase in particular is quite significant. I was always struggling, even though I spent so much time on Romans 15, mm. and never, I think, grasped it to the way as your proposal can now right. explain, okay. I think, Romans 15. Right. And since you've mentioned some of the passages that you're going to look at in yeah. the next few yeah. evening, I thought, well, Romans 15 must be there because the Paul, how he yeah. unfolded the dynamic of Christ, obviously dying for yeah. everyone, and then Paul's again referring to the gift from Macedonia and Achaia, yeah. Yeah. and then this phrase, particularly, they owed it. Yes. Because yes. They, yes. They, they, they share, they're, yes. they're blessed, they're happy yeah. to share yes. the gift, yes. but actually they owe it. Yes. And I was struggling yeah. with that yeah. in particular, uh -huh. and I think that sort of can be explained really. Yes in yes. the proposal that you're suggesting, you know, paying yeah. back, yes. actually to paying forward. Yeah. Perhaps you have a few words to say on Romans 15 in yeah, particular. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I may disappoint you on that. I'm not sure. I, I, maybe I'll have to rewrite that lecture now to include something on Romans 15. But yes, you're right. He does use very strong language of, of, of obligation, of, of owing. But the larger frame he puts that in, as he says to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 9, is this is your... Uh, obedience to the gospel you know so it's not just an interhuman obligation as it were you've given to me I owe you back so you've given to me as as and I receive the gift as a gift from God as it were through you and my relationship to God is what determines why I want to give back to you not just my obligation to you but but um, as you say I'm paying back to God as it were by paying by paying if whatever I've received forward to you. So, yeah, I think there's, um, every time we want to reduce Paul to just, this is just about human relationships, he insists on sort of breaking that open and saying, no, I want to talk about the grace of God in this, not just about how you're, you know, exchanging money with each other. So he keeps putting us back in that larger, in that larger frame. Thank you, yeah. Very good. It's always good to end with a compliment and yes. some inspirations on going back and rewriting things. Before we thank John and conclude our evening, um, let me thank you all, first of all, for coming out, for joining online. And we'll be delighted to have you back tomorrow evening and Thursday evening for the third and fourth part. But now let us thank John and then we'll have some time to share together. Thank you so much. Thank you.